and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about books and antiquity and art and culture and refinement and three cool guys. That's us. We're the three cool guys. We're going to talk about ourselves for the next hour. Uh, my name is Thomas Magby. I'm joined as always by Mr. AJ Hannenberg. That's me. And Mr. Graham Donaldson. A cool guy. <laughs> yeah, easy there, champ. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> well, actually, let's put AJ at the top oh, of the word. list of cool guys. Aww. I think I'd give you second, Graham. I'll take last 1,000%. I'm eating cake with a spoon. <laughs> That's, That's not uh, cool. Yes. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You are, in fact, actually eating my cake with a spoon. That's yeah. You're doing great. It's my cake now, buddy. I mean, because you're eating it, it's your cake. That's I've got the NFT, true. man. It's, I don't think that NFTs, they're not usually physical is one thing about them. Good talk. He's enjoying the cake. They just imply ownership. Okay, good. Anyway, today's episode is led you by... You said we could have it. <laughs> Did I, though? <laughs> After you took it out of the fridge. Uh, Graham, you are leading today's episode. I am. So uh, you want to take it away? Yeah, it's about um, sin and guilt and cake's theft. No. Um, today, we are going to be talking about a book that C.S. Lewis wrote called The Great Divorce. Um, and we're not going to be going through all of the book. Um, we're sort of going to just, I'm just going to outline a little bit about how the book is structured, give you one or two examples of some of the conversations. But I really want to look at a conversation that C.S. Lewis has with a character um, in the book. And it really centers in on that question. If there is one damned soul in hell. Hey, whoa, hey, whoa, this is Sorry. a family-friendly podcast. Well, I know, Can you, it's, hey, it's, easy. it's a technical term. Darned soul. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very no, no, much. No, they're, they're not darned. <laughs> <laughs> if there is, so, what does it mean when actual, you darn a sock? What does that the mean? The actual it's line like is, with a paddle. is that, I don't think that's, is that actually right? Isn't that ah. it? So the lie is, the <laughs> final loss of one soul gives the lie to all the joy of the saved. That's, that's the line. Okay. And so, C.S. Lewis I mean, if it is the character of Lewis, it's the narrator. The narrator sort of asks his version of Virgil. It's not Virgil, but his version of a guide. Hey, how, if there is one damned soul in hell, how, how can those in heaven have all of the joy of being saved knowing that there is, that there is this pu- eternal punishment? Um, does that not sort of, you know, um, does, yeah, the final loss of, uh, give, uh, uh, of one soul give the lie to all the joy and the saved. So this book is kind of, if I sort of wanted to sum up what this book is trying to do, it's trying to answer that question. Um, how can you posit a good God, some idea of heaven and a final judgment without feeling like, hard done by or kind of icky at the end or feeling like there's been some kind of um, uh, lack of mercy given to given to people. Now, that, don't you have pity for the yes. damned? Do you right. not have pity for the damned? Um, oh, does, also, it, does it not rob the joy of heaven to know that there are those in hell? Also, to darn means to mend with stitching. So it's literally the opposite of yes. damned, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, so, okay, the book. Um, so it is a dream. That's how it's framed. And the dream is a vision of death. Um, and I'm going to, uh, it's sort of, un- the, you, you realize this is what's happening as the story unfolds. So it takes a couple of chapters when you're reading it to realize, oh, there's something fantastical going on. And it's not until you get to kind of midway through the book that you realize that we're talking about souls who have died, who are kind of encountering people that they've known while they've been alive to kind of have the last final reckoning of their life. Mm. Turns out that they're actually having the last final conver- – they're having like the, 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 the final chance to make a decision for heaven or not. It was, it's what's sort of happening in the story. So the book starts off with the narrator um, realizing that he's kind of in this like kind of crappy town. It's just sort of like a little gross tourist town. Right. Uh, he's at a bus stop. And he's with all these people sort of waiting to get on this bus, and he doesn't really know what's going on. And, and everybody in the bus, they're kind of ornery, and, and um, uh, everyone's kind of jostling for position and trying to get to the front of the line as one does in a bus stop. And some guys are getting in fights, and one guy's like bribing a girl to get his spot by paying her off. And there's people who are, you know, he's just sort of in this bus with these like sort of, you know, kind of not too great people. They're sort of, you know, anyway. Um I know it really knows why they're getting on the bus, and some people are like, yeah, maybe, we, you know, there, there's not, it's not really explained why they want to go on this bus. Just something to do. Just something right. to do. Like, they're in line. Why yeah. not? <laughs> anyway, uh, and, they're, and so they're, they're talking about the town, and it's like twilight, and uh, the, the sun seems to be setting, but it's been like this forever, 
and no one really knows if the sun is setting. And one guy's like, maybe the sun is rising. And everyone's like, nah, I'm pretty sure the sun is setting, buddy. And it's like this eternal twilight. And they're all getting on this bus. And when the bus shows up, it is this glorious bus. And the bus driver is filled with joy. And he seems to be someone who Lewis says is just like, uh, has the joy of doing the job that he was asked to do. And everyone's like, oh, man, look at this guy. He's getting, look at this sunshine. <laughs> um, and all the people getting on the bus kind of make fun of him. Anyway, they get on the bus, off they go, and the narrator kind of, like, talks to people who are on this bus, and one guy's, like, a poet, and he's talking about all his poems. And um, one guy's talking about, like, how unfortunate it is to be with all these common folk, but, oh, well, we're going to go on this bus and see what they have to offer. Mm -hmm. There's another guy who says that, um, you know, he's going off on this bus to see if he can, like, get some cool stuff to bring back and, like, sell um, in this crappy little town. And then all of a sudden the bus sort of takes off and it's flying. And people, and they're like, holy crap, this bus is, is flying. And the narrator looks out and he sees that the, um, uh, that this town is actually spreading, has been, it's spread out much farther than you think. So you think you're in this little crappy town, but he looks out and he sees that this town is kind of like spreading out miles and miles of suburbia. And even off in the distance, he can see that there are like little pinpricks of light of houses that are kind of off in the distance. Um, uh, I'm going to explain what this means now, even though the, the, the character the himself hasn't. doesn't realize what's going on. So what this is, is that uh, um, the people who live in this town have the ability to, um, like, how can I phrase it? They, they can live wherever they want. And, and, and build it, like, instantly, And they right? can build it instantly. Yeah. So this is a town where if you want to uh, live in a certain kind of house, um, you, just you, you just think it and you get that house. And then it turns out that all of these people over time have been getting into fights and getting into quarrels. And like you're looking at your neighbor's lawn and he's like, you know, he thinks of a pool and you got a pool and he thinks up like a stereo system. and He's got a stereo system and you're like living next to him. And you're like, oh, gosh, darn it. This guy is like, you know, playing Skrillex at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, I'm out of here. Okay. And, um, and so then off you go and you can, you're living next to AJ in this picture. <laughs> you're living next to AJ okay, and he's, good. uh, but it's like the jerky AJ. It's like, <laughs> it's like AJ at his worst. Okay. Uh, it's like AJ if, you know, he, he let himself go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, no. Uh, no, as opposed to this, you know, this, the, the one this, that we actually have. No, no, I agree with what you. What was the intro you gave us? We were cool guys. No, three cool guys. Three Call cool. us antiquated. Well, uh, again, of the three of us, we're, he's the most likely well, to be he, listening to Skrillex, right? Yeah. That's mm. the only point that I'm making. This is your image of cool is Skrillex. No, no, it's the morning with a pool. Four in the morning, <laughs> please. Let's. I mean, no, it's my image of someone I want to move away from. Get yes. up off the house. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the point being that if you're living next to this guy, you can get up and move and like build your own house with your mind, and you can live there. Or maybe you'd go with a bunch of people. With your who, mind. All the people who hate the Skrillex dude can go and they can be like, all right, let's just move over here. Uh -huh. Over time, this town has been growing because people are well, getting fed up with each other. Right? Yeah, and then it's yeah, expanding. Yeah. And they're not growing. It's expanding yeah. and everyone's moving far and farther away. And, um, and it turns out that people have been living here for thousands of years. And um, we find out like Napoleon's there and uh, all, you know, and it's. Yeah. But because they've been there so long, they are. Hundreds of miles for anybody else. They're so far away that one guy said, hey, there are some people who came and they wanted to go see Napoleon and it took him 15,000 years to find his house because he was so far away. Right. And when they found it, he was like, no one was near Napoleon for like light years. Right. But when they got there, he had this like beautiful palatial mansion. And when they looked inside the window, it was just Napoleon pacing his house back and forth for days, muttering that it was, uh, you know muttering that it was anybody else's fault than his own. It was like, it was Josephine's fault. It mm -hmm. was, uh, um, you know, who was the, the, the commanding, who was the guy that beat him at Waterloo? Um, uh, that guy. What's his name? I can't remember. I the general. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Not Trafalgar. That's, that's, uh, that's. Um, There's a statue of him in Trafalgar. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but he was sort of, and so they realized that Napoleon's just sort of spending his days um, saying it's somebody else's fault. So they're on this bus and they're real. And so the narrator Oh, yeah, the guy who's going to buy, who he wants to go see if he can find some cool stuff. He's like, the reason why everybody, that there's no community, that there's no, that there's, the, the city doesn't work is because no one needs anything. The so Duke I'm going to go. Duke of Wellington? Is that the? Yeah, yeah, the Duke of, what's oh, okay. his name? I mean, oh. anyway. Um, I'm going to go and um, uh, I'm going to go and see if I can find a rare commodity and bring it back. And then people will have to live close to me because they're, you know, the scarcity of this thing. We can create like a society, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But because no one needs anything, this, this sort of civic fabric falls apart and everyone, once they quarrel, can move on. 
Okay. Um, we find out later what this place is. Um, but all these people are going uh, in this bus, and they arrive at this beautiful uh, sort of idyllic setting of nature and trees and mountains and streams and wildflowers, and it's gorgeous. And when all the people get off this bus, to their horror, they realize that they are see-through. They're ghosts. And that um, Lewis says that there's sort of two ways of looking at this world. Um, the world is normal, but the people are like smudges of people. Or if you like look out a window, if you look out a dirty window, you can like look through the dirt into the outside, or you can like focus and look at the dirt on the window. And Lewis says that's kind of what the people were like in this landscape. Or you could say that the people were, were normal, and the landscape was more real. So all of these ghosts, he now calls them, and himself included, all show up into this landscape that is more real than the people themselves. And Doesn't they like hurt them to like and walk they, on yeah, the and they grass. can't affect it. Right. So their little ghost bodies, they can't lift a flower. So um, the grass hurts. Right? The grass hurts. Little spikes. There's an there's an apple that falls on a tree and like smacks a dude and he like passes out. <laughs> Um, and it's the guy that wants to he wants to bring the the stuff back to sell ah, back in yes. the in the tourist town. Right. And he like tries to, this apple like smacks him and he like passes out for a bit and he like picks tries to pick up the apple and he, like drags it back to the mm. bus. Doesn't and he succeed in like he getting does. it on the bus? There's an angel like, dude, stop it. <laughs> That's the, it's, it's not going to do anybody any good. Like, it's not going right. to do anybody any good. But he still doesn't listen. He's still going to drag that apple anyway. And so all of these go all of these ghosts are like kind of they're like, oh, this place is terrible. <laughs> Uh, it hurts. Right. It's too bright. It's too shiny. And I wasn't made for here. Okay. And so everyone's sort of like freaking out and wanting to go back to the gray town is right. what it's known as. And then a, basically a caravan of people show up and these people are joyful and some are brightly robed in beautiful clothes and some are shining in, in their nakedness, but it's like not a nakedness that you would be ashamed of, um, and, you know, Lewis being a, a scholar of Milton, like it's sort of the pre-fall nakedness of man. Right. And these people show up and they are, um, you know, made for this country. And the ghosts, uh, the people from the bus are terrified. Some of them are terrified of them uh, and some are freaking out. And then this begins. Um, and then Lewis says that as this caravan shows up, they all kind of like fan out. And each creature, each of these heavenly beings sort of... Um, sets their sight on one of the ghosts mm. and goes to talk to them. And then the remainder of this book ends up being these conversations between, um, uh, and they're not angels, but between uh, those who are coming from heaven, mm -hmm. from God's kingdom, and those who have come from uh, the, the gray town, which we find out is kind of hell and kind of not hell. It, it depends on, well, it depends on what's happening. And so all of these, these the, the, uh, the souls of the saved come and talk to the souls of the potentially damned. Right. Uh, and that's who these ghosts are. And so then this begins this interaction between these characters. So um, just to give you an example, the, um, the interactions themselves are really fascinating. And personally, for me, there was one interaction between a theological, a theology professor and his student, mm. yep. which makes up all of chapter, I think it's chapter five, um, chapter five or chapter six. Is the student the one that's trying to get together a discussion group? No, no, the, the teacher does. Teacher, the right. student is the one who, who's, in, who's heaven. in heaven. Who's in heaven. He was one of my favorite characters yeah. on yeah. the bus. He's yes. like, if we could just get together a theology discussion group. And they're yeah. like, bro. You're yeah, in hell. Like, it, it already, <laughs> what are we discussing? Yeah. Like, we know what's happening. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that particular chapter was one that cut through a lot of the below, the BS in my life hmm. uh, and was quite impactful for me because I saw that I could have easily become that teacher. Did, have you said already when the first time you read this book was? Um, it was probably, I was probably maybe 18 or 19. And did it have that college? impact on you? Yeah. Like the first time you read it? It did. Okay. Um... It, I mean, I was, yeah, It and The Abolition of Man were okay. the two books that had the, a very big impact on me, particularly that chapter. The rest of it I didn't really understand at that time. Sure. I've, I've come to read it and quite enjoy it now, but there was other, there was parts of the book that I was like, oh, I don't get this. Um, anyway, so there are these interactions. So one is there's kind of this like gruff blue collar worker who's really, you know, um, um, the phrase he keeps uttering is like, I want to get my, I want to, you know, have my rights. Mm -hmm. I have my rights. 
Um, and he's coming, he's like, I'm coming to check out this place. And the, 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 the go of the angel that come or the, the being that comes to talk to him is somebody that used to work under him who had murdered somebody wow. and had repented. Yeah. And the, the, the ghost of the big man, that's how Lewis calls him, just can't get over the fact. He's like, this is not fair. Right. He's like, I lived a good life. I never did anybody wrong. I, you know, had an honest day's work and I got an honest pay and I never did wrong by anybody. And you murdered somebody and, and hey, if they let you in, that's like their business, but I don't want no bleeding charity. Right. And the guy's like, no, you want the bleeding. <laughs> you want the bleeding charity. like Specifically the bleeding type. Yes. The yeah, bleeding. Yeah, yeah. You good, were not yeah. a good man, right. says... Um, says the angel, or says the the the, the saved soul, and right. the man's like, "How dare you say that? Like right. you murdered somebody." And he's like, "Yeah, but we have a good we have a laugh about it now. Like that's not the me murdering him was not the worst thing that I did in my life." He says, mm. "Actually, the worst thing I did in my life was I hated you, wow. and uh, and my you were my boss, and you made our lives miserable, and you made your family's life miserable, and I spent so many days." thinking about how much I hated you, that I have been sent back to ask for your forgiveness. Wow. And the big man, Ghost, says, like, I don't want your forgiveness. Uh, uh, how dare you pry into my life about how I treated my family? You guys are just a bunch of, this is just a click. Right. And you guys are, you know, you're just a click up here and you keep me out. All I want is what's owed to me. And the and the uh, the saved soul is like, you don't want that. Right. <laughs> you don't want what's owed to you. You want the bleeding charity. And to the point where the big man's like, ah, screw this noise, and he gets back on the bus, right? So you get these kinds of interactions. Another interaction is the one that I described earlier, is that there's this theology professor. He was actually a bishop in the Episcopal Church. Is that Um, true? Yes. (laughs) Um, And he has sort of gone into the new fashionable theology, and his former student, who, according to the bishop, got quite (laughs) narrow-minded towards the end of his life, because he actually believed in in the resurrection. Right. Um, this angel has, or sorry, this this saved soul has been sent down to him, and um, um, and uh, he's like, the reason you're in the gray town is because you're an apostate, and the bishop is like, well, well, let's not put some, you know, we don't need to put such a use such antiquated terms, mm. and um, and so they they go back and forth, and um, uh, the student says, do you remember that when you were young, you used to ask questions because you wanted answers, mm. and now the old angel's like, oh, and so the old ghost is like, wow, we don't, you know, uh, it's not about answers, it's about the journey, and it's about discovery, and um, and they have this big back and forth. Uh, let me just see if I can find some some fun quotes from the uh, from this discussion just to give you a flavor of what's going on. Um, um, let's see. Um, so this is what the, the, um, the saved soul says about being with that man in that, um, in, in that sort of headspace of really sort of poking holes uh, of this sort of new liberal theology, um, just to give you a flavor. So at the end, yeah, AJ was right that 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 the the the, the ghost decides he's not going to go to heaven because he want he has he has to deliver a paper back in hell. Sure. Um, uh, with his, to his the, theology circle, right. and the nature of the paper is because Christ died such a young man, we don't know how his fully developed uh, theology would have been okay. if he had lived to old age, uh-huh. and so his paper is on trying to think about. What if Christ was given the opportunity to fully develop mm. his his movement? Okay. Then this is probably what his theology would have been. Okay. Um, and at that point, uh, the ghost is like, "All right, you, you know, um, uh, yeah, good, good luck to you." Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, he's on uh, his own at that point. Yes. The um, uh, he says, "I shall end up by pointing out how this deepens the significance of the crucifixion. One feels for the first time what a disaster it was. What a tragic waste." Such promise cut short <laughs> because oh Jesus goodness. was killed. Right. Oh my word. Yeah, um, but the um, but this is what the the saved soul says. Um, um, well, they're, they're talking about their life. Um, um, the, the the bishop says when the doctrine of the resurrection ceased to commend itself to the critical critical faculties which God had given me, I openly rejected it. I preached my famous sermon. I defied the whole chapter. I took every risk to which the angel replies, or to which the saved soul replies. What risk? Right. What was all uh, at all likely to come of it except what actually came? Popularity, sales of your books, invitations, and finally a bishopric. Um, And then 
the, the saved soul continues and he says, Our opinions were not honestly come by. We simply found ourselves in contact with a certain current of ideas and plunged into it because it seemed modern and successful. And then he continues on. Having allowed oneself to drift, unrestraining, unpraying, accepting every half-conscious solicitation from our desires, we reached a point where we no longer believed the faith. Just in the same way, a jealous man, drifting and unrestraining, reaches a point at which he believes lies about his best friend. A drunkard reaches a point at which, for the moment, he actually believes that another glass will not do him will do him no harm. The beliefs are sincere in the sense that they do occur as psychological events in the man's mind. If that's what you mean by sincerity, they are sincere and so are ours. But errors which are sincere in that sense are not innocent. So, because the, the guy was saying like, well, I honestly, uh, I sincerely believe this and I followed my, my uh, sincerity uh, to where it led. And the guy was saying like, yeah, but you're, we were still wrong. <laughs> right. Um, this, this reminds me of the... In Dante, the circle of in the sixth circle, it's the city of Dis, which mm. is where the like the heretics are punished. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, it's sort of outside sins of incontinence, like mm-hmm. lack of self-control and sins of malice. Right. Because mm. it's not really classified as either. It's almost being honestly mistaken and yeah. misleading others. Mm-hmm. And it is hard to classify as a sin because it might be sort of a, you know, an honestly believed mistake. It doesn't mm-hmm. stop it from being wrong. Yeah. Um, so anyway, these are the interactions and what, uh, there, there's a bunch of others. There's a man who is sort of beset by a little gremlin who is clearly lust. There is another tragic one where there is a man, the real man is like this tiny little dwarf and he is leading. It's a woman, isn't it? No, it's a little man who's a tiny dwarf and he is leading uh, he, he has on a leash this man who's almost like a puppet. Um, and the, 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 the saved soul that comes to see him is his wife. Um, and you get the sense, and I'm not going to get into it, but when you read it, you realize that this man had sort of been emotionally manipulative to his wife in that there was like his real self and then what he called and what Lewis calls the tragedian, this person who was always sort of setting things up as like this a big emotional tragedy. And it turns out that he had kind of been um, using emotional blackmail on his wife her whole life. Right. Um, and now she has come back to basically say, you need to, you know, you need to cut the cord between you and this false version of yourself. So there's all these really sort of like interesting psychological portrayals of people's relationships with their sin. Right. But um, the, uh, um, the, the mechanism of the story is that People are confronted with people they knew in life, and the relationship between these people are um, where the, the, the lost soul needs to be confronted with that central thing, um, that there's always something that they insist on keeping, something that they prefer to the joy of going to heaven. Now, they, they think, well, I can't make the journey to heaven. The grass, is, the grass hurts my feet, and this place is terrifying. And all the angels, or all the saved soul says, as, t- as it goes on, if you would just let go of this thing you're holding and come with us, you will find that it gets easier over time, and these souls won't do it. Um, there's one um, who is you know, a mother um, who is, uh, uh, want, you know, so angry at God that God took her son from him from mm-hmm. her early, and um, and the 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 person that is coming down to confront her I think is a sister or something. Uh, um, I didn't I didn't read that part for this for this podcast, so I, I didn't go through that that chapter. But the point being that every all of these damned souls or all of these potentially damned souls are confronted with somebody for whom a conversation with them is going to get right to the heart of the reason why they would not choose God. The, 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 this one thing that they want, that they would insist on keeping. Um, so for like the gruff man, it was, you his know, rights. his rights and that he, you know, he's so proud that he lived, you know, he wasn't as bad as that other guy. Right. And the intellectual bishop, it was, you know, he felt that he he had this sort of like, you know, this this keen mind of inquiry and he didn't want, an- he didn't want God to answer his questions. He wanted to go on asking them. Um 
But um, so everybody's confronted. So there's a fun little there, there. There's an interesting sort of spiritual exercise that we could probably do ourselves, which is if we were the ghosts coming up on that bus, who would be coming down from the mountain to talk to us? Like who would be that person in our lives for whom it would be the it would lay that central thing about our personalities bare that one thing that we want to keep on we want to keep hold of more than we would get we would be willingly let go of to be with god on the mountain anyway that's that that's not the point of this podcast but it's just like a an interesting thought experiment to say like what is that thing in our own lives that we are holding on to that we refuse to give up because it really would mean the death of self for the life of Christ. Um, anyway, um, at this point, uh, at some point in the story, the narrator uh, gets sent a guide. Can I? Sorry, oh, yeah, can go I, for it. Just in response to that part, sure. it's also the like the person who you'd be shocked made it. Yeah, and, like <laughs> the like, murderer. Yeah, and or someone who you're so certain that they went to hell that they don't deserve heaven and then to realize they made it and you might not. That's right. It would be someone like maybe someone who like stole your cake or something, right? Like <laughs> yeah, I would yeah, be coming yeah, down me, shining. Sure, yeah. Obviously. <laughs> Good, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. He's great. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, 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 maybe that opens it up even further, but I think everyone has, you know, or I'm just a curmudgeonly person, but everyone has that grudge who you're thinking yes. that person deserves eternal um, torment. Mm-hmm. And then to realize, no, they had a weak faith that saved them in the end. And that was enough. Um, so, oh, yeah, facing up to that also. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, anyway. So, And so as this goes on, there's a couple of times where the, the saved souls say to the, the ghosts um, that the place where they came from, this gray town, um, is hell if they choose to go back there, but purgatory if they choose to come up to continue on their path towards heaven. Because they do get another chance to come. Yeah. So Lewis, this whole story is, Lewis makes reference to this idea that the damned get to go on holiday. What was it called? (laughs) Um, um, There's a name for it. Um, That there's this old sort of medieval concept that um, that, uh, the, the, the damned in hell can come and go on holiday to the foyer of heaven, so to speak. Um, um, anyway. And that's the trip that they take at the very beginning. That's the holiday they're taking. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And that, and so that everybody has an offer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's called refrigerium. Okay. Um, um, it, uh, prudentia, uh, someone named prudentia, prudentius, um, it means that the damned have holidays, excursions, excursions to the foyers of heaven. Um, so anyway, at this point, and so there's an old Christian tradition that Emperor Trajan yes. um, goes on this. And when he is encountered with the gospel, he's like, yeah, that's what I want. And, and, and he's, he's in paradise in Dante. Mm-hmm. I think he's the only Roman emperor. The only, the only, the pagan, only pagan yes. who's in paradise. Um, that this idea that like the virtuous souls do actually get a chance to go and see the truth for what it is. Right. And insofar as that they're virtuous, be like, yeah, 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 this is what I wanted all right. along. Right. And then, um, and that's what this sort of is being described in the story. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So it's, at this point, the narrator meets up with a Virgil-like character, yes. uh, a guide. And for C.S. Lewis, it is George MacDonald, uh-huh. who is a, a, a Scottish Christian author who is absolutely fantastic. Oh, really? Uh, his most famous book is probably The Princess and the Goblin, if you've ever heard of that. That's like a children's book. Didn't he also write Fantasties? He wrote Fantasties. Because I hated that book. Am oh, I doing this wrong? So oh, good. okay. Hey, Jay hated that book, too. I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm a moderate. Like, uh, Fantasies was okay. He also it's wrote not the, a story. The it's Light not a story. Princess, mm-hmm. and The Light Princess is fantastic. It's not a story? Fantasties is Fantasties, I mean, it's, it's a, a series of, like, a images. Story. It's a series like, of images, which, yes. the, But that was my, I, I got, I was, like, four chapters in, and I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. Yeah, there's there's no real story. It's okay. just a, it's a series of good? almost, like, alleg- spiritually allegorical imagery. It's okay. almost like just a book of symbolism. Graham, AJ, before we go any further, I want to thank our Patreon sponsors for making this episode possible. Uh, our Patreon sponsors support us at one of four levels. I'm going to go through them right now because I think many people listening 
they want to be a part of this as well. They want to become patrons as well. Uh, we have a $2 a month tier. Those are Ghibellines at $2 a month. You get access to all of our episodes ad free. You also get access to previous uh, uh, content that we've done mostly at uh, conferences. Um, so you get ap- uh, access to many other uh, bonus episodes as well. At $10 a month, you get access to our our uh, in-between episodes, which we record after every single episode that we record. You also get access to our monthly AMAs, which I think are really funny, some of our best content. In addition to all the same benefits at the $2 a month tier, you get access to ad-free episodes. Above that, at the $20 a month tier, you uh, at that point are giving input into the podcast. You are helping us come up with future topics to come up with future merchandise in addition to all benefits from the tiers below that. And finally, and you heard about this uh, in recent episodes, we have added a Helios' Acolytes of Love tier at $100 a month. At this level, you are a true believer and you are the most faithful of our listeners. At this tier, you get all the benefits from lower tiers. You also get, I can't believe I'm saying these words, that you get a Helios' Acolytes of Love crewneck sweatshirt. You get Helios' Acolytes of Love Crocs and you get all... a free uh, copy of all future merchandise as we create it. So incredible, incredible benefits at this, at this level that is only for $100 a month. You can find all of this at patreoncom slash classical stuff. Thanks again to our patrons and um, thank you all for listening. Oh, the, the light princess is about a kingdom where there's sort of a begrudged old aunt and like auntie, not aunt as in with antenna. Yeah. And she, she comes to the birth of this new princess and she curses her and her curse is that she loses all her gravity. Oh, but it's in more than one sense. Oh, she spins off into the air because she literally is not affected by gravity, but she also can't take things seriously. So she can't truly (laughs) love when people get hurt. She just sort of laughs at them. Okay. She, you know, she's the kind of person who would see someone beheaded and sort of like run tittering off into the woods, but for her, it would be floating. Right. Right. Okay. Except when she is swimming for some reason, when she's in the water, she's fine. And she eventually meets this prince and he sort of sacrifices himself for her joy to hmm. bring this lake back that was dying. And then she finds her gravity and then everything as well. But it's it's a wonderful little book. Probably take you 40 minutes to read. It's short. I just put it on the list to get from the library. So thanks. It's good. Um. Anyway, so... Um, but why is why is George McDonald... So Virgil showed up because Virgil was so impactful to Dante. Why same does, thing. Okay. George McDonald was so impactful to uh, C.S. Lewis. True. Uh, Fantasties and these kinds of books were something that, that Lewis was really yeah, impacted by Chesterton and, and McDonald. Um, George McDonald is just... He's fascinating. His books of... His sermons are amazing. His poetry is... His sort of divine poetry is quite good. Um, but he's very... He's thick mm-hmm. like not in not in terms of, of incomprehensible but it's just like there's so much packed into mm-hmm. his phrases like chesterton that right. it's like it's like drinking espresso you can just if you have two of them you feel gross sure um so if you have too much if you have two chapters of george mcdonald you're like blah now and i want to say i think i listened to the audiobook of fantasties and you know i'm listening at like two times speed trying to finish a book and that's not the right way to experience that book uh, so no. that's probably very much on me yeah um so he comes up to uh, George MacDonald, and George MacDonald explains that, yes, this is a place where the, the souls of hell, which is maybe, or maybe purgatory, can come and can encounter heaven, at least the foyer of heaven, and um, can sort of encounter beings that are going to unearth that thing inside of them, and they get the opportunity to make that choice, um, to give it up and, tr- and give themselves up and travel with the beings to heaven, or to sort of double down onto their own conclusions, get back on the bus, and go back to hell. Um, um, And so, um, so Lewis asks of George MacDonald, but I I don't understand, is judgment not final? Is there really a way out of hell into heaven? It depends on uh, on the way you're using the words. If they leave the gray town behind, it will not have been hell. To anyone that leaves it, it is purgatory, and perhaps he had better not call this country heaven. Not deep heaven, you understand. You can call it the valley of the shadow of life. And yet to those who stay here, it will have been heaven from the first. And ye can call those sad streets in the town yonder the valley of the shadow of death. But to those who remain there, they will have been in hell even from the beginning. So he continues, you cannot in your present state understand eternity. Um... um uh, 
they say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it, not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. And of some sinful pleasure, they say, let me have but this, and I'll take the consequences, little dreaming how damnation will spread back and back into their past and contaminate the pleasure of the sin. Both processes begin even before death. The good man's past begins to change so that his forgiven sins and remembered sorrows take on the quality of heaven. The bad man's past already conforms to his badness and is filled only with dreariness. And that is why, at the end of all things, when the sun rises here and the twilight turns to blackness down there, the blessed will say, we have never lived anywhere except heaven, and the lost, we were always in hell, and both will speak truly. And so, it's, so first of all, this is a, maybe an, an, an apologia or an explanation as to the sufferings and pain on earth. McDonald's is saying that for those who suffer to the end, they will look back and the, 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 the glory of heaven will recast and rework all of the sufferings of life into the preamble of heaven. Right. And for those in hell, even the glories or even the joys of life will be seen as the beginnings of, of the, the miseries of hell sure. towards at the end. All of those in heaven will say, we have always been here, and all those in hell will say, I have always been in hell. And so it's this idea that, like, heaven and uh, hell is like a continuation of the attitude of the people who rejected and went back onto the bus. Sure. And heaven is the beginning of abandoning the self and sort of accepting reality for what it is, accepting the game for what it is. Because later on... Um, so Lewis says, oh, then heaven and hell are just states of mind. Oh. And the angel corrects him. And he says, hell is the state of mind. You've never said a truer word. And every state of mind left to itself, every shutting up of the creature within the dungeon of its own mind is in the end hell. Hmm. But heaven is not a state of mind. Heaven is a reality itself. And, that is, and all that is fully real is heavenly. Um, and um, so this is sort of, yeah. The, the first we're, – we're getting to that big question that Lewis asks later, which is, well, what happens of the, the final souls who choose, who choose hell? But it's this first idea that in the end, at least as far as Lewis is concerned, that hell ends up being this choice. That it's not or, – or if it's not a choice, it's not a choice because you have – your habits of personality have been so wrapped up in that – thing that is keeping you from God, mm -hmm. that pride or that arrogance or that, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the bastardized version of love, um, that, uh, and it's so baked into your character that when given the opportunity to abandon it and sort of like shed yourself and go with uh, the beings to, to sort of walk into heaven like a child again. There are some people that just refuse to do it because the, the, to them it would, be feel, it would feel like such a death to the self because it's so wrapped up in their self. Maybe like an indignity. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, you know, in, in our AMA, uh, we were talking about most embarrassing moments, mm -hmm. right? Like it would be too embarrassing to, um, for that bishop to, um, to like get on his knees and repent right. and ask Christ into his heart. Right. right? <laughs> and that's super funny because those moments have been some of the most formative to me. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I talked about the time after when I made sort of a fool of myself and I was sort of laughing at myself in a bathroom stall. I, I still remember that as sort of a formative moment. You know? right. Yeah. Th these moments where you, where you, it's not that yeah, you, you sort of stop regarding yourself as important, but not in a depressive way, yeah. but in a, in a like seeing rightly way. Yeah. Um, but can I ask, is, yeah, it, go for it. is it correct to call these, are these actual choices? So taking your quote, if heaven goes back in time, essentially to, so that the person says they've always been in the state, the person in hell has always been in the state. Hasn't their decision already been predetermined by the point there again, Lewis would say it's a dream. Don't take it so seriously, but uh, I, I'm just wondering, is there an authenticity to that choice that they're presented with in that moment? Yeah, so in the book, McDonald makes reference to the fact that even those who don't get on the bus and come to heaven oh. at some point 
I think he was saying that Christ even goes down and mm. personally talks to everybody. Mm. So like Christ goes and talks to Napoleon, right. but Napoleon's like not interested. D- doesn't even want right. like go away. Like right. I have bigger important things to think about. Right? right? There's some point where like Christ Himself comes to you to offer you eternal life, but you have been so wrapped up in self that is it a choice? Is it not a choice? It doesn't really matter at that point. You've like the choice was not predetermined, but the choice was made long ago in the fact that you were unwilling to sort of get out from it. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I just wonder, sort of the, yeah. yeah. But it, uh, again, we're not really delving into this, but there's, you know, the question of um, free will versus uh, predestination. And again, to what, or, uh, so almost you, uh, you would look at, yes, there's this moment of decision that Lewis is presenting in Great Divorce, but there's something that's prepared them for that moment. I guess I'm wondering, like, what is that? Like, is it fully, does Lewis go into this? Is this fully the person's choice, you know, 50 years before this moment kind of set them on this path that then ended with them rejecting the chance at repentance? Does he go into... He doesn't, but I mean, like, um, even in an individual person's life, there must be some point where you realize, well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm just wondering if like people who realize that they're like supremely proud and arrogant, is there a point where they, in the quietness of their own soul at some point say, man, I kind of am a jerk. Um, I I think C.S. Lewis would also be a proponent of the notion, and that was a whole lot of words to say, C.S. Lewis probably thinks that, <laughs> that, it's a weight of numerous small choices. Yes. yes. Along with over maybe time. a couple of big right. ones. Right. But it is it is those the like those choices over time that will sour a man's soul. Sure. And you eventually become numb to them. And like the bishop, right? He probably like he originally and asked questions to find answers. And then right. over time, small little things got him to the place where he didn't want the answers anymore. He wanted right. to ask questions and get fame. Right. And and here they are presented with with another choice. Isn't there a point later in the book when he starts to talk about temporal realities and he's basically saying this choice is not a, a like what you are seeing is a representation of the choice that people have throughout Mm. their lives, not a singular moment. So the the man can choose to abandon his tragedy in the face of his wife, right? right? That emotional manipulation. And what you are seeing is a representation of that choice boiled down to a couple seconds, but Mm. it is a lifelong choice. Sure. I think, I think that comes in the later chapters. I could be wrong. It's been a while since I read it. That's what these moments feel like, though. It's more than just that one moment. Because yeah. they've been prepared for one outcome or the other based on everything up to that moment. But I also think that there there are there are moments of grand choice in a person's sure. life. Right? Yeah. But in the same way that you are tilted one way or another on those decisions based on, the like you said, the little decisions you make sure. leading up to it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, so there's a point where there is uh, an interaction between a married couple. And it was the one I was making reference to earlier, where the man, as a ghost, is a, is a dwarf, uh, a, a sort of a short, little, mute creature. And he's holding the chain of this regular-looking man. And this regular-looking man is um, clearly sort of like the false front of, of what the real man is. And um, the, the basis of this relationship is that he kind of was this overly dramatic um, husband and um, was kind of emotionally uh, abusive to his wife and um, uh, always was making reference to, like, their love. And, um, um, and Lewis calls him the tragedy. And getting into that whole story, I, I don't really want to get into it for the sake of time. But the point being that she has come and she has said, listen— I, um, I have come to tell you that you need to stop acting and you need to uh, abandon this sort of false front and you need to um, come to love itself. And, um, and he's, you know, um, um, let me give you an example here. Um, she says... Uh, quick, she said, there's still time. Stop it. Stop it at once. Stop what? Using people, other people's pity in the wrong way. We have all done it a bit on earth, you know. Pity was meant to be a spur that drives joy to help misery. 
but it, can, it can be used the wrong way round. It can be used for a kind of blackmailing. Those who choose misery can hold joy up to ransom, by pity. You see, I know now, even as a child you did it. Instead of saying you were sorry, you went and sulked in the attic. Because you knew that sooner or later one of your sisters would say, I can't bear to think of him sitting up there alone crying. You used their pity to blackmail them, and they gave in in the end. And afterwards, when we were married, oh, it doesn't matter now, only if you will stop it. So he's the kind of guy that uses, like, the, the good-natured pity of others to, to get his way. Right. In and, this case, he's like, don't you care that I'm yes, in hell? Yes. You, you, how can you be happy up here while I'm down there? And she's like, I have to be happy. I'm in heaven, yeah. but you can be happy too. Yes. And he's like, I couldn't do that thinking you were up here mm -hmm. happy when I'm sad. Um, and he's like, and that is all you've understood of me after all these years? I don't know what's become... Uh, uh, um, so, no, Frank, not here, said the lady. Listen to reason. Do you think... Do you think joy was created to live always under that threat, always defenseless against those who would rather be miserable than have their self-will crossed? Um, and he's like, how can you use that, you know, the sacred word of love? Uh, and she's like, I am happy. I'm, uh, I, have, I, have, I am in love itself. Right. Uh, um, and he's like, how can you say this? And while this is going on, he is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until he finally disappears and she turns around and leaves. So he sort of poofs into nothing. He's right. so tiny. Um, um, you do not love me, said the tragedian. And she said, I cannot love a lie, said the lady. I cannot love the thing which is not. I am in love, and out of it I will not go. And then he vanishes, and she says, presently the lady got up and began to walk away. The other bright spirits came forward to receive her, singing as they came. Hmm. And so Lewis then turns to George MacDonald and asks that question, how can she be happy and how can she be, you know, in glorious heaven knowing that the man that she spent her entire life with, her husband, who is this, like, person that used his own misery as blackmail to get her to do what he wanted, um, is, is still miserable in hell. Um, and George MacDonald says, would you rather he had the power still of tormenting her? Right. Um, and he says, no, I don't want that. And he says... Uh, then George and Dylan says, well, what do you want? And Lewis says, I hardly know, sir. What some people say on earth is that the final loss of one's soul gives the lie to all the joy of those who are saved. And George McDonald says, well, you can see that that's not true. You can see it does not. Um, and George McDonald says, that sounds very merciful, but see what lurks behind it. The demand of the loveless and the self-imprisoned that they should be allowed to blackmail the universe, that till they consent to be happy on their own terms, no one else shall taste joy, that theirs should be the final power, that hell should be able to veto heaven. Um, um, either the day must come when joy prevails and all the makers of misery are no longer able to infect it, or else forever and ever the makers of misery can destroy in others the happiness they reject for themselves. I know it has a grand sound to say you'll accept no salvation, which leaves even one creature in the dark outside. But watch that sophistry, or you'll make a dog in a manger the tyrant of the universe. Um, and then... Um, But then, and so then they sort of equivocate on the word pity for a little bit. Okay. Um, um, anyway, so, so this ends up being kind of the answer that Lewis gives to that question of um, how can there be joy in heaven when there are the souls who, have, who are damned? That's an can I, can I yeah, make sure I understand it? it? So it's, a, it's really interesting because most people would say, uh, wouldn't it be great if everyone went to heaven? There'd be no suffering in the afterlife, right? Mm -hmm. But um, McDonald's point, Lewis's point via McDonald is that that gives control to that, um, the person who's chosen misery yes. to set the terms of what will allow them into heaven. Mm -hmm. So instead of heaven setting a bar essentially and saying that you must be pure to enter this place, um, the person who's outside gets to, I'm, I'm missing it at this point. They get to say who's worthy of getting in they get to it's the black it's well he says it's sort of the emotional blackmail right okay. like so 
instead of like as a little kid, instead of apologizing, he sulks, and then yes. the sisters are like, who love him, right. say, oh man, I just can't think of him crying his eyes out, and right. they go and they're like, no, come on, I'm sorry, even right. though they did nothing wrong or right. whatever, um, right? And so, um, but in heaven, uh, at least here, the wife of this sulky man right. is saying, I I'm not allowed. I'm not going to love you on those terms. Right. Um, you have to stop it. You have to kill this thing, this false front, this like weaponizing pity. Right. You need to release it, and only then can you begin to actually be in love. Um, and he is so wrapped up in in weaponizing pity for his own ends, and he's like, "Oh, you, how dare you utter the sacred name mm. of love?" Right. Um, and then he gets smaller and smaller and right. smaller and smaller until he disappears, and she turns around and is welcomed back to the angels, and is seemingly unaffected. Right. Um, and and uh, Lewis is like, "Oh, well, that's so sad." And then the, the the question is like, "Well, what's the alternative? That he gets to enter heaven, but be a sulky shorts?" No, that that, that uh, or that she gets to go to heaven, but she has to feel bad the whole time yeah. because he's down in hell. Like yeah. it, it gives it gives still hell really, yeah. the emotional veto. That's right? right. So everyone in heaven can be happy, but they have to remember and pity those in hell. And it's like the it's like going to an amusement park and your cranky nephew hates everything and just ruins the day. Mm-hmm. And so he he gets all the power he, because he can yes. ruin the day for everybody uh-huh. because he feels bad and everyone else is trying to have a good time. Yeah. So at some point. They get to have a good time. Yes. Uh, but, at some point, so, yeah, sorry, maybe he says at some point, um, um, there must become a day when joy prevails and all the makers of misery are no longer able to infect it. Sure. I don't know. Are we, will we get to the story where there's a positive outcome? No. Oh, so there's one, one, there's one of these stories where someone actually makes the right choice. Yeah. And so I, the alternative would be... And he abandons his sin, which I think yes. was lust in this case, or some sort of sexual deviancy. It was, it was lust, and yeah. the guy crushes the little lizard that's sitting on his shoulder, and yeah. it becomes, it dies, and then becomes a stallion, and yeah. he rides off on it. But it's, yeah. like, incredibly painful, right? Like yeah, it, yes. This, this is not a pleasant experience mm-hmm. that yeah. he goes through. So the alternative is that instead of him being given the choice, his sin is killed for him. Does that... Yeah, I think in that scene... He's like, you kill it, you kill it right. to the angel or to the heavenly being. She's right. like, I can't do that. Right. You have to do it. Sure. To the point where there's that choice where you need to sort of. No, I think the man had to give permission. So oh, the angel was right. like, I can kill oh, it that's if right. you want. That's it's right. on your shoulders. Yep. If you simply really want it done. And he's like, I don't know. It's right. going to hurt. And he's right. like, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to hurt. hurt a lot. Yeah. It's going to hurt a lot, but yeah. it needs to be done. And eventually yeah. the man says, yes, yes, that's right. Please kill it. Yes. And he doesn't it kill it. He, and then he has to give permission for it to kill it. Which is a great little allegory. So he can't be forced to be saved. Heavenly help. Right. But the man has to be willing. That's my, the alternative would be that instead of each of these people being presented with that choice, they would just have the sin eradicated from them to then make them worthy to enter into heaven. <laughs> what are you, a Calvinist? Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, I'm just, I'm just posing that as like, isn't that the better, not, I'm just asking, is that a better alternative than, because now we have four people who haven't conquered their sin who have to get back on the bus. You know what I mean? Like that. But the thing is, but you, if you do that, then you're, then, then um, your free will means nothing. Then mm-hmm. love means nothing, right? If, 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 if there's not a choice for you to actually choose mm-hmm. joy, mm-hmm. Um, like this is sort of what everybody says. Well, if, if I was actually like, if you showed me heaven and gave me the choice, of course I would choose it. It's like, well, I don't think but when were. the choice comes down to the complete abandonment of the thing that you think is the core of you, when really it's the, it's the sin, this sort of sinful tendency that has infected your soul that so much so that the real you has been completely shriveled up, like... Right. No, that's a hard choice to make. If you think of the Lord of the Rings, isn't there that that king who is so under the power of that little gremlin guy? Wormtongue. Yeah, Wormtongue. That, uh, and it's not until he, um, yeah, he's so under that, so under the influence of Sauron or whatever, Saruman, that uh, I can't remember. It's been a long time since I read those books, right? But this idea uh-huh. that the once noble person has been completely infected to the point where they don't, they can't even see reality for what it is anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, so anyway, this was a whole long discursion, the, the sort of uh, uh, roundabout way to get to that central question of, well, then how can, how can those, how can you sort of be comfortable with the doctrine of hell? And for me, this has been the most, that, that sort of answer to that question, which is that the doctrine of hell is not some sort of like punitive place where we send all of like the creepy people just to be poked with sticks and like head, you know, upside down and right. burning poop or whatever, right. like in Dante. Um, but it's actually 
the place where when we say, not your will be done, my will be done, God says, okay, your will be done, fine. If that's your final choice, your will is done, and you go off, and hell's kind of a place where you get everything that you want except God. Right. You want to think up a big old house? You think it up and you get it. You want like Skrillex at four in the morning, <laughs> right? And I do. I do want that. <laughs> right. You think it up and you get it, right? right? You get everything that you want except you're going to be alone right? because everybody else gets what they want. Right. Um, and so and hell- And sometimes those clash. <laughs> and sometimes those things clash. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what hell is. Uh-huh. And what heaven is, is you giving up that ability and having to go to that very like- painful center of that thing that drives you in as opposed to allowing God to the the thing that's actually sitting on the throne of your heart as opposed to God sitting on the throne of your heart and kicking that thing off the throne um, and that is not an easy thing to do in fact it's a very painful thing to do and so uh, heaven is really you know um, heaven really is won by sort of the violent men who take it by force, right? Like the, 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 um, heaven is really only for those who are sort of willing to go and, um, right down to the, to the center of that pain of what sin has wrought in their lives and cry out from that pain, asking for the little lizard to be killed or whatever. Right. right? Um, for me personally, that has always been a much, more palatable and also intuitively understandable concept of hell, especially as somebody who, as a little kid, would I I found myself, and maybe I still do that to a certain extent, that sort of emotional manipulative thing where, well, if I'm not having a good time, I can definitely weaponize my pity in such a way to make sure that nobody has a good time. That is a hellish quality. Like, that is an infection to anything good. Like, your nephew at uh, at, at Disney World. That was not a real thing. Your theoretical nephew. (laughs) It was a theoretical. I love my nephews. No, I know what you mean. But, like, that sort of ability really is, like, that has no place in heaven, Mm -hmm. that that characteristic. It is the same same question people ask, like, how can you laugh and have a good time when people are starving in Africa? Yeah. And... There was a there's a a Chesterton quote. I was looking. At, I was trying to search it up, but he talks about how the suffering almost has no point if nobody gets to laugh. What are they suffering for? If there is no laughter in this world, then the suffering is just suffering for suffering's sake, right? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't quite totally line up with what you're saying, but joy has to be allowed to have some free reign, and mm-hmm. at some point, it has to be completely free reign. And I think that's what you're talking about. And in the very uncomfortable theological position that Lewis talks about in this book is for those of the saved, any pain that they have in life in the light of heaven ends mm-hmm. up being the sort of preamble saying we have always been here. And even if somebody had like the easiest, cushiest, awesomest life on earth, mm-hmm. a family, you know, who loved them enough money to be able to be leisurely, but if they allowed themselves to slowly allow their sinful nature to metastasize into every corner of their personality and let that continue for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. Um, like that, that is, that is hell and misery. And so then at a point we're saying like, well, what are we, um, is it more, is it more tragic that there is that, that, you know, that sort of the injustice of the, the kinds of things that we have in this life? Um, or, uh, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the soul that chooses self over God, right? Like at that point, the scales become, the become so, um, out of whack that, that, that sort of calculus of misery right. no longer makes sense in the light of, of heaven and hell. Sure. Um, anyway. That's interesting. I need to, yeah. I need to think about that. It's more. still it's still pretty challenging because right. like yeah it's easy to say sitting around on a Saturday afternoon talking sure. about this and it's not easy to say if you're you know in the midst of of you know present suffering but um, and I always find that very challenging when Lewis is like yeah but that poor guy he's like he's such a he's such a like sulky pants going down to hell and McDonald's like what else do you want to do right. like that's yeah. This American Life just on Sunday put out an episode on uh, grief and um, I guess both good use of you know, how grief can be helpful and how grief can be unhelpful. But one of the stories is about a person who over the course of the story dies. Sorry if that's a spoiler, but 
like they have quotes of him like before he dies and all he can talk about is the misery of the world and how horrible things are and um like the point of the story is supposed to be like how bad death is but like that those moments of him he's given a platform to say whatever he wants to and all he can see is the misery around him that's the part that stuck with me of like graham you've talked about this before we eventually become whatever we're becoming and that like that way that that's crystallized right before his moment of death is just a really scary thing for me to hear about yeah i, that's I think terrible. that plays into what you're talking about then of so that's over the course of a life well then multiply that out thousands of years millions of years right um and that <laughs> those trajectories don't get better right yes yeah. yeah yeah um i mean one of the the core comforts of the christian faith is that like death is a speed bump right? right death is a death is not the end right um it's much more dangerous to be the soul that is grasping after self in this yes. than to be, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, than to 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 die having been someone who has sought Christ in their life. Right. Um, Lewis, other points not in this book. Lewis talks about like. Um, two soldiers fighting in a war who both kill each other at the same time and find themselves on the other side right. and like have a good laugh about it. Right. <laughs> right? Like that kind of attitude to me is a, is a distinctly Christian one. Like sure. that is, that is that sort of attitude towards death yep. is a distinctly uh, uh, sort of um, Christian attitude. It's also the attitude of that creepy wizard in Ghostbusters two, right? Death is not the end. It's true. Yeah. yeah so but that's, that's not the same attitude, though. It's not quite. It's not exactly the same attitude, but, you know, attitude. like death is but a door and yeah, yeah. he has this weird yeah. creepy thing he yeah. says. Is that Rick it's Moranis? different if it's no, coming it's from like a scene. Anyway. <laughs> I don't, the wizard? I don't remember. All right. That's my, that's, that's sort of the uh, uh, Lewis's cool. apology <laughs> for, of like, why hell? Uh, what is hell? And hell, uh, to summarize the entire thing, and this is a famous Lewis line, is that hell is a door locked from the inside. Mm. That, that the people who have chosen it have locked everybody else out. Sure. All right. Thank you all for listening. You can find us online at classicalstuff.net. You can email us at the guys at classicalstuff.net. You can find us on Twitter at classical stuff. And we're on Patreon, patreon.com slash classical stuff. Uh, we'll keep the conversation going in our Patreon in between episode. If you want to get that, head to patreon.com slash classical stuff. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.